Children International is working to end child poverty around the world by giving kids access to a safe place, a team, and a path out of poverty by focusing on health, education, empowerment, and employment. Together with people like you, we're more than a nonprofit. We're a powerful force for change. Learn more at children.org. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Uh And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, November 23rd, 2016. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Becky Bond, Zach Exley, former senior advisors to the Bernie Sanders campaign, And their book, and authors, I should say, of Rules for Revolutionaries. How big organizing can change everything. Also on the program today, as we flee the office for Thanksgiving break, a song from Jimmy Reefercake. A non... I want to say it's a non-partisan song. doesn't take any... Electoral, political, so people, uh, your positions. So I don't want to, there's, there's a little sensitivity to that right now. Um, folks, right now I am headed to, uh, probably as you listen to this, I'm in the car with some screaming kids. Uh, probably, probably a screaming wife. She's probably screaming at me too. Everybody's screaming at me. Driving uh, to the, uh, well, it wasn't actually the place of my birth, but it was where, where I was raised to uh, celebrate Thanksgiving. I'm really debating whether or not I should talk about the imminent conflict, but I don't think I should. I'm debating about this. There's just somebody, let me just put it this way, okay? There's, there was, a, there was, I'm not going to name names. Kelly's shaking her head. I'm not going to name any names. I'm not even, just actually, let's just make this hypothetical, okay? This is totally hypothetical. Hypothetically, let's say you got an email from somebody, person A, who was forwarding something from somebody else. And that somebody else had a meme about like, like, uh, you know, if you protest, uh, do it for human rights. If you protest about a president, you know, you're just crying. But they, they forwarded this. But they left whose email it was. And so, hypothetically, What I would do in that hypothetical is I would write back to that person, you know, uh, I got news for you. You know, the, this guy is a, uh, he's, he's got neo-Nazis in his, uh, cabinet or he's got white, he's got anti-Semitists and white nationalists in his cabinet. He's being praised by, uh, you know, neo-Nazis in this hypothetical. I have a daughter and, um, Uh, I think it's perfectly rational to be protesting this because at least then I can turn to my daughter and say, hey, you know how we told you not to say certain things and how you should have respect for all people, regardless of gender, regardless of race? 
regardless of where they've come from, that there should be some, at least some sophistication in discourse. Like you shouldn't like reference your penis size as an attribute uh, in, in politics. All those things that we have taught you for your entire life, if you were hypothetically alive, and I was hypothetically saying this to you. And then she sees that they're, they're being rewarded because kids look at like the presidency like it's like a superhero, even at that age. Like, I think, it's, I think it's actually helpful for me to be able to say, those people are protesting because not everybody subscribes to that notion. And hypothetically speaking, if that person who had sent the meme was going to be at Thanksgiving, maybe hypothetically I would have said, like, and you could tell, maybe, maybe uh, that hypothetical person will have the opportunity to explain to my hypothetical daughter um, just, you know, why, why people shouldn't be protesting something like that. Okay, so let's say uh, I was to respond that way. And then by hook or crook, <laughs> that person who, had, who was not really involved in this at all, I just forwarded something to that other person, saw the, my, my reply. Just by hook or crook. Okay? And they wrote back. And there was like the dripping conservative agreement, aggrievement. People should be allowed to have their own opinions, which is, ironic, which is ironic, right? Because criticizing people for protesting. People should be allowed to have their own opinions. And then tells a story about a Russian, Russian dissident pulled out of their house at 3 in the morning because they, 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 their, political, their politics were wrong. 70 years later, that person's kid comes to America and celebrates America. And so... Imagine, in this hypothetical, how I would respond to that email. I would get really angry and be like, you got to be effing kidding me. I sent an email. I didn't pull anybody out of their house. But then I calmed down. I calmed down, and in this hypothetical, totally hypothetical situation, I send an apology. I'm sorry. I apologize for my tone. It wasn't something that you should have been dragged into in the first place. Maybe if that original person had any type of uh, savvy, they would have stripped your name from that email, or maybe they'd take ownership of the sentiment instead of hiding behind you. But again, I apologize, which is what I did, hypothetically. But then this person writes back. Oh, and hypothetically, what I would have said would be like, oh, I apologize for the tone, blah, blah, but, um, you know, uh, we're, um, emotions are running high around these parts. I think would hypothetically the way I would be phrasing it. And then the person writes back, hypothetically, well, we, we shouldn't let rationality get in the way. Uh, we shouldn't let our emotions get in the way of rationality, particularly for those of us who are allegedly educated. This is how you respond to an apology. And so, hypothetically, in that situation, what I would do would be like, oh, okay, well, I thought we were done after I apologized for my tone, but apparently you do want to litigate this. And then at that point is when I would express... I don't think there's an equivalence between responding to an email and getting pulled out of your home in terms of like silencing your opinion. But need I remind you, your original point was these people, uh, they're just whining because they're protesting. There's a lot of whiny Russian dissidents too. Right. And I said, I also think it's perfectly rational to protest this person. And I think you'll also find the most educated people in our society are the ones who are the most upset. And then, hypothetically, can you imagine this person would write back and say, oh, I wasn't talking, I was talking in general. <sighs> yeah. 
if you can imagine something like that, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost impossible for me to imagine it. Fortunately, you don't always need an imagination. Sometimes more imaginative people come up with stories for you. Like Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. It's an audio drama told week after week. Feature stories about crime, love, mystery, or conspiracy with actors you know and love. Some are dramas, some are comedies. Some are dark comedies. Okay, the one I gotta say, uh, the one I listened to uh, most recently that I really enjoyed uh, was Air Force One, where it is a, what would you call it, historical fiction right, of what it was like on Air Force One as they're flying back from Dallas after the uh, assassination of JFK. Timely, 11, it's November 22nd today. Oh, my God. Impossible. Impossible, Matt. All right, well, there you have it. So um, this is actually uh, November 23rd, smart guy. (laughs) But, yes, it's timely. It's interesting. it's fascinating to look at, to look back and imagine how these people. And I have to say, for me, you know, I do uh, another radio show with with um, with Bobby Kennedy, and um, I know when he tells these stories, uh, they're fascinating to me. So check that one out. You can subscribe to Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery dot com, wherever you listen to podcasts. But that way, you don't miss out on a single episode. So make sure you subscribe to Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It doesn't matter. New episodes drop every Tuesday. You know, it's like your favorite TV, your drama, or comedy, but only sound, and your imagination. And, of course, the imagination people wrote the stories. Make sure you don't miss a single episode. Subscribe to Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, folks, let's listen to uh, Jimmy Reefer Cake's uh, song. It's just, how long is it? I know people are a little touchy about it, but Jimmy wrote a very sweet song for uh, the holidays. It's um, a minute and a half. And, you know, we, yesterday uh, we had Janine on. We talked about how you handle uh, dealing with it. I think this is as good as way as any to uh, deal with um, any conflicts going on. And, and, you know, if I wasn't, maybe I'll try and sneak off and get inebriated uh, pre-Thanksgiving, but we'll see. Here's uh, Jimmy Reefer Cake on his prescription. What's the name of the song? A Reefer Cake Thanksgiving song. Well, there you go. On this Thanksgiving, I hope you don't dine alone, right? And when you head to Grandma's house, take yourself a big fat J-bone. And this time when you head outside, Please don't do it alone I said this Thanksgiving I beg you to get your grandma stone I this Thanksgiving you can count on the data being praised This Thanksgiving I bet you your grandma will be blazed Breaking down the barriers is what Thanksgiving is for But the hypocrites can't stand that like I've always said before. Grandma and Uncle Bob are stoned out of their friggin' heads. Cousin Troubles using reefer oil like a cracker spread. As long as no one's driving home soon, none of this is wrong. Gather round now as we sing a reefer cake Thanksgiving song. I said, gather round now as we sing a reefer cake Thanksgiving song. That was nice. That was nice. I like that because it was much, it was, it was like, uh, it, it captured the spirit. What's going on? I can't hear me. Can't hear my, uh, my machine. Give me a little applause. There you go. Jimmy. Very nice. Coming back strong. Everybody should get uh, completely wasted before they get to... Uh, <laughs> but not, not drunk. I think the point is, you get high, it's a little bit more low-key. I don't know if it's a good idea 
I have a feeling if I got drunk before I went to Thanksgiving, there would be a real, real mess. A real mess. Here's the good news about this holiday season that's coming up, though, for me, personally. Not just that I, I'll go and see my in-laws, and that's where I will get drunk. I will get really drunk. Drunk enough that I can't even open my mouth because I don't want to get into a fight. But this year, unlike most years, where hol- holiday shopping is virtually impossible for me, thanks to MVMT, Movement Watches, all that gift-giving anxiety can disappear with a press of a button. These watches make the perfect purchase for just about anyone in your life. And remember, they start only at $95. Now, I know you've heard me talk about the MVMT, the movement watch that I got Nikki. She loves it. Fortunately, she doesn't listen to the show. She doesn't realize how inexpensive it was. Um, She thinks it's like a $400, $500 watch. But it was a beautiful watch. It was the $125 one, the silver, I can't remember, the silver sky or something like that. But it's a beautiful watch. Um, This holiday shopping season is here. And with MVMT, you can skip the crowds and standing in crazy lines at the mall and find a gift they'll love at prices that beat the department stores. Movement watches start at just $95. At a department store, you're looking at a four or $500 for this watch. They figured out by selling online, they were able to cut cut out the middleman and they cut out the retail markup, providing the best price possible. Classic design, quality construction, styled minimalism. Over 500,000 watches sold in over 160 countries. Here's the best part, folks. You can get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns. By going to mvmtwatches.com slash majority. mvmtwatches.com slash majority. Watches have a really clean design. Nikki loves hers. I'm going to get her a second one. Because that's the way I roll. If I find something that works, why, why, why fix it? Go to mvmtwatches.com slash majority. Join the movement. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, Zach Exley and Becky Bond, there will be no show uh, tomorrow. It's Thanksgiving. And on Friday, we will um, we have a pre-recorded show, a couple of interviews I did uh, from Ring of Fire that I know you'll like. We'll be um, right back with Becky and Zach. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to both welcome back for one person and have on the program for the first time Becky Bond and Zach Exley. They are the authors of Rules for Revolutionaries, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything. Uh, Both of them served as senior advisors on Bernie Sanders' presidential uh, campaign. Uh, Welcome to the program, Becky and Zach. It was great to be here. All right, let's start with, I mean, you know, when we booked this uh, uh, interview, uh, I think we were anticipating or at the very least hoping for a, a, a different outcome. And, and I want to circle back to, to that aspect as to has anything changed um, from what you prescribe uh, based upon the outcome of this election? And maybe we can talk about maybe different strategies. But first, I want to talk about where... What this came out of uh, this book, Zach, what, why, what, at what point did you and Becky say, we've got to write this? 
Um, well, I actually, it did not occur to me to write it because I, I knew that I would actually not get anything like this done. So, so, <laughs> and, uh, and Becky had the perfect strategy for getting it done. And so we, uh, we hold up in a cabin and, um, and we and we just banged it out and uh, and so you know it was I think it was in this but but I, I think our real impulse to write this uh, was you know to make sure that what happened on our little fringe of the campaign uh, because you know we you know we weren't uh, the Bernie campaign we weren't the Bernie organizing campaign we were this uh, we were this distributed organizing team is what we came to be called and uh you know we started with a couple of people um claire sandberg and myself and uh then becky joined us and we were able to hire a few more people it was always a very small team and our job was to organize people in all of the states where there was no field staff on the ground and over time field staff did come into some of those states and then we wound up working with them and they kind of you know took took they took over the show at that point and, and we knew that was going to happen and we had this weird little team that was trying to for once make this huge mass of volunteers in an insurgent presidential campaign uh, be, we were to actually make them really effective at turning out votes. And, uh, and we, our main lever to do that with them was by building a phone banking system, which Becky really was the one who you know, enabled us to build that. Uh, and and, and you know, we learned a lot. Uh, it was the first time that something on this scale happened you know, in, in non-staffed states. Um, on this scale of organizing and, you know, on a presidential campaign and uh, maybe, you know, you know, maybe in, in any kind of a, of a, you know, actually, you know, focused, you know, staffed campaign. And we just wanted to make sure that the lessons kind of got written down and got out there. And, you know, there was so, so much great innovation on the Obama campaign in 2008, but all those people went into the White House and were not able to pause and write. So, you know, the one thing we had going for us after Bernie uh, lost, uh, the nomination was we, you know, had the luxury of sitting down and writing this stuff up. Yeah, so, I mean, and actually, you know, part of the story was um, someone who's been involved in progressive politics for or, or progressive activism and social change movements for a long time, uh, Alison Barlow, um, and she's someone who has been involved in the progressive foundation world, and she sat me down right before the New York primary, and she said, she said, Becky, there are so many social justice groups, and a lot of them. You know, don't have a lot of resources, and they really need to learn some of the powerful organizing lessons that you guys are learning on the Bernie campaign. You know, can you write down some of the lessons so that we can share them with these social justice groups? And she really said it was really important to do this now um, because there are so many big, urgent challenges. And so, you know, it was really from her making it clear that we needed to do it. And I thought, yeah, we need to, instead of having people have to hire consultants from the Bernie campaign and only groups that can pay can, you know, sort of learn a lot of the things that we learned, let's put it in a book and then we can share it with everyone. Um, and uh, not just organizations, but some of the super volunteers who organize their own city um, and give them a reference book so that they can actually keep doing this work. So, all right. So to be clear, basically you guys were the, um, we called you on a military campaign. You'd be the irregulars, essentially, right? And yes. Yeah. Um, the uh, so w tell us specifically what is distributed organizing. So distributed organizing, you know, it, it, and on a lot of campaigns, this is called the digital organizing department. Um, and so, you know, distributed organizing is how we use technology um, to get people to do actual, real, valuable work, um, no matter where they are. Um, in terms of geography and um, no matter what time, you know, they have available to work. So um, so it, we basically take a central plan and we distribute the work to people all over the country, but they're all working towards the same goal. Now, I mean, how does that work, Zach, on, a, uh, on the context of a campaign? I mean, what is it? Are you, are you just encouraging? Is it all just phone banking? I mean, what, um, what, how did people from your... I guess, slice of this campaign, how did they contact, uh, what did they do once they were organized, I guess? Well, that's the thing. So when, when, when Claire and I first joined the campaign and kind of got these 46 states uh, at the time, it was 46 states that were not staffed. And we, we literally had hundreds of thousands of people that had signed up to volunteer and that were really angry uh, because we were not putting them to work. And I mean, you know, we got like, you know, 
you know, really hostile phone calls. I mean, most people were very understanding, but understandably, we got, you know, very, very hostile people reaching out to us sometimes. And I to we totally respected that. And we felt like we were letting them down every day. And so we were scrambling to try to, um, you know, get, get give people a direction to go in. But the interesting thing was that, um, you know, the, the, the thing that helps win elections is voter contact, is talking to other voters. And, uh, and, and we, unfortunately, we, weren't, we didn't have access um, for a while to the kinds of tools that help voters do voter contact or help volunteers do voter contact in a systematic way. Like we did not have, you know, the voter activation network, the van, which is this, uh, you know, tool that lets people go knock on their neighbor's doors and record the results and all that stuff. We just didn't have that. We weren't allowed to roll that out to the volunteers. And so it was when, um, finally, when Becky joined us, well, no, no, don't get me wrong. We, we gave people all kinds of stuff to do, but they, they knew they weren't, you know, we, uh, you know, we said, go out and recruit volunteers, um, you know, hold leafleting events, hold flyering events and, you know, discussions and, you know, bands for Bernie for the purpose of signing up volunteers. But people knew that that, you know, they could have been doing more. So it wasn't until Becky joined us, you know, about a month later or so, and she had this experience from the Credo Super PAC, um, where they really, you know, empowered um, these volunteer-led uh, campaigns all over America and many different races at the same time um, to do voter contact. And, and their main tool also was phone banking. So she really knew the technology and, you know, knew that this could work. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we built a team uh, you know, she built a team ar around herself to actually implement it on this ridiculous scale. Yeah, I mean, it was basically just the idea that, you know, the most powerful way that you can um, organize to move voters to the polls is for a volunteer to talk to them. And it could be their doorstep and it could be on the phone. Um, we did a lot of this by text message also. So what we were really trying to do was build a giant voter contact machine that volunteers could be part of no matter where they lived. Um, because we wanted to give everybody something to do that could materially help Bernie win the contests, especially the early ones. Uh, okay, so you guys have outlined uh, 22 rules. What, um, uh, Becky, give me your, uh, what you think is the most important one. Hey, wait, actually, can I, can I back up for a second, though? Sure. And, and I just want to add something to what we're talking about, because it's, I think it goes to an important place, is that, um, is, you know, what, what wound up happening, um, you know, as we got closer and closer to Iowa, and then we got into those, you know, those early states, uh, was we, we had this national voter contact capacity that was really huge. And we, we, were, we had the capacity to actually call every voter on the Nevada voter file list. Uh, you know, every voter that we had a phone number for, we could call every day. We actually had that big of a capacity at, you know, uh, when, we, when we actually got up to, to Nevada. Um, now, uh, you know, just imagine if we, so this is what, this is why, you know, we, we wanted to write this stuff down and make sure that, that future campaigns understand this. Um, there are so many people that are desperate to get involved and make a difference. And we only scratched the surface of, of the capacity that was out there to organize because, you know, we got started so late, right. you know, you know, Bernie kind of, you know, announced that he was running, um, you know, not incredibly late, but later than he could have. And and with no infrastructure, you know, there was almost nothing, in, you know, on his campaign when he announced. So it, it took a long time, um, you know, to, you know, we, we were only really just starting to be able to grow quickly uh, when, you know, when we got close to Iowa. So that was a real shame. If we could have kept, you know, if we had had another six months, um, we would have had enough people mobilized and organizing uh, and, and making calls to you know, perhaps even call a really huge chunk of the voters, like a very significant uh, slice of the voters in, in all of the Super Tuesday states, uh, for example. So, um, well, let me ask you. you know, I mean, so, you bring that up because I mean, yeah. when I talk about why I think um, uh, Bernie Sanders didn't win, the me for me, you know, and and nobody knows. These are all you know. Everybody's just sort of has an opinion on this. But for me, I think uh, six months is really uh, the first answer I have. Like, I mean, if Bernie Sanders yeah. had gotten into the race, let's say nine months before he did, with a determination that uh, and a belief that, I mean, I don't even think he would have needed it when he got in to believe that he could have won, because I think he would have uh, come to that realization in the same amount of time. It just would have been nine months earlier. Um, yeah. 
Uh, let me ask you, you know, I don't know how fair of a question this is, but I mean, if you had two guys had to pick on one thing uh, that would have was the but for in terms of Sanders, w- w- would simply time have been the difference? I, I mean, uh, you know, we might have different answers on this, but I think uh, I think that would have been one thing. Yeah, I think that would have made I think that would have made all the difference. And notice that we're blaming, uh, you know, factors internal to our campaign, you know, and not, uh, you know, factors. We you know, will get to that. that we we will con- get to that. Yeah, yes. Not things that we could not control well, of- uh, outside of our campaign. But no, I, that would have made a huge difference. And then, of course, you know, all the little errors that, you know, that that we ourselves, you know, personally made in execution, you know, you want to go back and do all those things right. over. You know, there's so yeah. many decisions that... But there's always uh, a 10% yeah. contingency built into every project you do, right? I mean, you always are going to mess up a certain amount. So it's really, uh, there's yeah. the, sort of yeah. the... Uh, and, and I think that's true of, of any endeavor. Uh, uh, Becky, what about from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the <clears throat> um, if, if we had started earlier, that would have helped a lot. And, and I also think... You know, it took us a while to learn some of the lessons that are in the book. Um, and we knew that we had to build a campaign from volunteers, um, and we knew we could trust them to do big things, but I don't think we really, in the beginning, we really got it. So, for example, you know, we let, we, we encouraged volunteers to organize phone banks, you know, in, in, um, in the later states to call into the early states like Iowa and, and Nevada, but you know, what we didn't do is we didn't empower them in the fall to start canvassing their own neighborhoods because they would have made the calls into the early states and they also would have been um, starting the, the canvassing and working on the voter list where they lived. And we didn't, um, we told them to wait, that they had to wait and that we couldn't help them do that so early that their turn would come. And, you know, I think that we, I think in some parts we worried that if they were organizing in their states, we wouldn't have enough people that were organizing to help us win the crucial early contests. Um, but in retrospect, I think they would have done all of it. And basically, you know, one and of it the probably lessons, would have enhanced it would have enhanced both of their jobs. I yeah, mean, it, it, if, yeah, if, yeah. If, yeah. if you go door to door, you're getting a sense of what the arguments or, or how, yes. the appeals you're going to make on the phone and vice versa. Yeah. And you're getting better at it and capacity is growing. But you know, we, what we learned was that people are just waiting to be asked to do something big if if the reward is going to be that you're going to win something truly big. And so um, and so we did ask people to do big things, but I think we could have asked them to do even bigger things. And, you know, people can't, can't, can't fit canvas effectively without being able to access and then contribute to the central voter file for the campaign. And, um, and that was something the volunteers could not do without us making it a priority. And so if we could do it again, you know, we would, um, we would give access to the voter file, the campaign voter file, to the volunteers in the states um, from the very beginning, you know what, what's interesting about that is that you know when 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 I hear that you know like one of the things that I think my sense is about you know the the idea of being able to give the volunteers more work and in many respects more responsibility too. The 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 thing that strikes me is one of your lessons. I'm going to pick one of them out because um, is the the uh, the tyranny of the annoying is because the concern I think that. Broadly speaking, uh, these endeavors have, particularly ones that are sort of mixed, paid, and volunteer, is that Mm -hmm. the volunteers, like, it's going to get out of control. Like, something's going to spin out of control because there's going to be, or not so much just sort of like iron clench control, but just that um, uh, people are going to go, you know, sort of like uh, hog wild or whatnot, or people are going to derail something. And so tell us about the tyranny of the annoying, because on some level, like, there's you're both willing to give a more responsibility than I think people generally uh, feel comfortable doing in this context. But at the same time, you're also willing to sort of pull the plug and tell people you got to move on. Well, the, the key, though, is, you know, we gave volunteers responsibility. Uh, the key is that, that we gave volunteers as much responsibility as we could. But that went along with a structure and accountability. And so people had roles. They knew what, you know, when it was working and, you know, when we were setting it up right, uh, they had roles and they knew what their goals were and, you know, and we could measure those goals. And it was hard. It was really hard to get that set up, to get that kind of accountability set up. Um, But, you know, eventually we did get it with the phone banking. We got it with a few other things. Um, And uh, so it's, you know, it is important, you know, that, that, you know, to, to, to not get the idea that our message is yeah just like let everybody go do cool stuff and it'll be great 
And yeah, the tyranny of the annoying is one of the, it's, it's uh, one of our rules is defeat the tyranny of the annoying. And, you know, this is a phrase that, you know, we've kind of used for a long time. And, uh, the, you know, one of the reasons why, if you don't give people clear structure and roles and have accountability is there's this tiny minority of people. I mean, it's really just like one in a hundred people that are just sort of determined, you know, they're just really, um, counterproductive. They want to take over the group, you know, um, you know, Did this come out of like guy, the general assemblies? Guys, in uh, I mean, it reminds no. me of like sort of what sometimes what yeah. would derail like the general assemblies in uh, in Occupy on some level is yeah, that yeah. But one no, person no, with their to... specific agenda and everyone has to bend to it. But it's just that's just universal. That wasn't right. specific to Occupy. That's that's in every single group. Yeah, and when you think about it, I mean, the people that come to get to work, if if they're if they find their time is wasted because organizers are too polite to shut someone down who's brought their own agenda to a group and is is taking up too much time, you know, then the, then these disruptive people, no matter how well intentioned they are, they're hurting the movement. And so we really wanted the people that wanted to come to work and they were heads down and they were good on a team. And so that was our responsibility then when people were, you know, wasting the time of the group, you know, to be able to move those people out so that other people could continue to do to do good work. And I think this is something as liberals, people really feel like everybody's entitled to take up space into their own opinion. Um, but but you really have to um, you have to respect volunteers and the time they're putting in. And you know if you have a room full of 100 people, you can't let you know someone um, even if they just take up five hours talking about something that's not on the agenda. Um, if they, they just if they just take five minutes, you multiply that by 100 people, and it's hours of wasted time. Right. And and we just couldn't afford to let that go. All right, let's. Do, I want to turn to a piece that you guys uh, wrote in, um, um, in in I think it was Huffington Post, uh, I believe. I'm not sure where I where I actually pulled this from, but it is. Um, yeah, uh, it was Huffington Post. Okay, and and it, it, I mention it just because I mean we're pre-taping this, but uh, to, on on today's program, I spent 15, 20 minutes uh, on the phone with a uh, a guy who argued essentially what you argued in this piece, and he had lived it in Pennsylvania, um, which is that Hillary Clinton's get-out-the-vote operation may have turned out Trump voters. Now, his argument was that there was essentially a, uh, uh, a piece of data that existed in the partisan index, essentially, that voter files have that um, was wrong as to whether or not it was predictive of them voting for, for Clinton. Uh, give me, and, and that's, a, that's a rough summation, but uh, give me the summation of, of, of your argument, Zach. Well, well just, well, well um, I think Be- Becky has more to say right, on Becky, this than me, then, but, but, well, but, I, but I, did, I just wanted to, to start, though, by saying that it's, like, the reason we wanted to write that was because of our, we wanted to point to this other way of going about things, and that there's a, you know, a paradigm shift that we should really be uh, having right now. And, you know, because of, you know, what we were just talking about, about how it's actually possible to mobilize enough people to identify who your supporters are, not by modeling, you know, so we've been, we got all excited about big data and modeling, but actually, uh, we have the capacity if we, if we can, you know, excite volunteers and give them something big to work for to actually ask people who are you supporting so becky yeah, and, so so yeah, becky think, so what went wrong yeah. here this big data versus big organizing what went wrong well here, here we have a lot of questions right and so what we're doing is we're throwing out questions because obviously you know the democrats lost an election that they should have won and the implications are are enormous um and dangerous um and so you know what we've seen anecdotal evidence of and what your and what your caller saw was that you know we were hearing from people who did GOTV, so they were getting out the vote, um, a list of voters that were supposed to be for Clinton, and they were knocking on their doors or calling them or sending them text messages on election day, and they were finding that they were reaching a lot of people who were enthusiastic Trump supporters. And you know there could be a few things wrong with your walk list on election day, but it, 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 by the time election day comes around, these lists should be pretty much, you should only be talking to your campaign supporters, right? And there, people there could be identified. people that have been identified as your campaign supporters. And so there could be, you know, like a couple mistakes every once in a while. But the, but the numbers we were hearing from people, we thought maybe there's something wrong. And, and the reason why we bring this up in part is that we think that it is a symptom 
um, of, uh, uh, of um, a, a sort of problematic attitude towards organizing that's, um, uh, that, that's part of how the Democratic Party runs elections. And it's this, it's this what we call a small organizing approach. And, and what happens with most federal elections is a candidate will hire consultants, often an expensive firm, um, that will take a look at the, um, the voters in the district and they'll come up with a plan. Um, who, who are the fewest people that you can talk to and turn out to win the election? And it's often a slice of swing voters. You figure the base will turn out at a certain amount, and then you've got these swing voters, and so then you just sort of do a turnout operation on that. And the people that run the campaign really try, they, they really try, um, they don't try to talk to as many people as they can. And when election day comes, these consultants, they take the list that they've modeled, and some volunteers come in, and then they basically try and turn out everybody on the list. And, and you know, there's another way to do politics, and this is how we did it on the Bernie campaign, but how a lot of grassroots candidates do the work is, is you take a big approach to organizing. And that means you have, you know, a candidate and a message that is um, really resonant, resonates with the people, and so you're able to get a lot of volunteers. And those volunteers talk to as many people as they can, not as few people. And they talk to people, and they hear about their concerns, and they find out you know, each individual voter that they reach at the door on the phone, are they for your candidate? Are they against your candidate? Do they need persuading? And then when election day comes along, you have this list of people that you've already talked to and an influx of other volunteers come and continue this conversation and turn people out on election day. And the problem with the small organizing approach is that if you get some assumption in your model wrong, right, and we wonder if there was an assumption right. that was in the model that was wrong, these models really rely heavily on party preference, and, and, and that might have been part of it. Um, if there's assumption, then it can have disastrous results, not even that you don't turn out some people that you should, but that you might have your volunteers turning out some of your opponent's uh, voters. And so, and you know, if there was a feedback loop where you were regularly talking to voters, you'd be hearing back, you know, our messages are or aren't resonating, or wow, you know, we got some Trump voters, we need to look into this. I mean, and in fact, Debbie Dingell, who's the congresswoman from Ann Arbor, was you know actually yes. you know actually spoke in public and said, I was trying to tell the Clinton campaign that we were in trouble in Michigan, and you know there was just nowhere from this feedback from people on the ground to go. That I mean, I mean it's not that there's nowhere. We have to wonder what happened to the feedback from people on the ground when they got it, and um, were they not talking to enough people to actually know what was going on? Because you know there certainly was enough volunteers in the state of California, you know, that in the last week before the election, that if they had been well, on a dialer, they could have called every single number in Michigan um, to, to recalibrate the model and see an ID who should really be turned out on election day. And so, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, what, 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 what is it about that? What was it about the campaign or just, I mean, is there something ideological that, that, that runs in here or is it, is it, I mean, is it stuff like it's just, you know, the consultant that's get that they get hired. Um, there's more money in doing it a different way for them. I mean, like I'm looking at like the the advertising that took place in uh, in, in L.A. versus Milwaukee. And, we, you know, there, there's no explanation for it um, other than the fact that L.A. has got a much more expensive media market. And if I'm getting 10 percent commission, I'm going to of course, I'm going to buy my ads in, in L.A. as opposed to Milwaukee, particularly if it's just very lucrative for me to assume Milwaukee's in the bag. Yeah, I, you know, that's a good, I, I, you know, I wish people would ask the campaign that question. So why did they make these decisions? Was it because they had a hard time recruiting volunteers? Um, you know, they never implemented a dialer for out-of-state volunteers. I don't yeah, know if they had them in the crazy. States. that was crazy. That was crazy. So I, I'm not sure. That, uh, uh, very strange. Um, all right, so let me ask you this. I mean, with with uh, you know at the very least well, well and also go ahead. Oh, wait, and just on that you know i mean there's, there's you know like um what is the expression wednesday morning quarterbacking what monday we, what is that monday morning monday morning quarterbacking okay right um oh right i see somebody was joking about wednesday okay yeah so there's there's monday morning yeah so this would be wednesday morning quarterbacking because it's the day after the election but anyway so there's there's the you know uh monday morning quarterbacking that's you know the thing is that's what happens after a football game you know, uh, you know, because who cares about a football game? The problem is, is that we actually, you know, there are decisions being made right now about who's going to run the Democratic Party, right. about what kind of people are going to staff the Democratic Party. You know, candidates are, are you know, may have to make decisions, you know, about what they're going to do, how they're going to build their campaigns going forward. So 
this is a conversation that absolutely has to happen. And, you know, it's it's really sad. I mean, you know, I, I worked on the Kerry campaign, I worked on the Dean campaign. We both worked on the Bernie campaign. We both had many losses. We know how bad it feels to lose. Um, and we and we, you know, and and we've critiqued our own losses, uh, you know, right after we've had them, actually. But we also know how it feels when other people critique them. It doesn't feel good. But, you know, when when somebody like Donald Trump is allowed to win um, and, you know, really setting our whole country in a totally different direction and a, a very scary direction, um, then we have no other choice but to, uh, you know, get on it right away and figure out, you know, not, and you know, and this isn't about figuring out like, oh, did some, did this person make this mistake? It's not about that at all. And that's absolutely not what we and, you know, others that are trying to figure out this stuff are talking about. Um, you know, it's about the philosophy and the approach to politics and organizing. Well, this is also, I mean, it's a sort of a uh, corollary to the, the um, you know, the, the, the tyranny of the annoying. Is that like, look, we, you know, we can't afford to uh, to make this about people's feelings at this point. I mean, it's not you know nobody's looking to bring anybody into the uh, the town square and put them in uh, in the stockade. But the, the 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 bottom line is like this is a major 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 screw up with massive horrible uh, implications, and, and that's the best case scenario. It seems to me, um, it, it could even get worse than that. So this stuff is really important to get wrong. I mean, to right, get right, and it's you know, I mean, uh, the the fact is, I, I mean, the, the the real question is, is there something I to me, and, and and you know, and I don't know that there's an answer, but from the ideology that made these mistakes more possible. I mean, I feel like there were decisions made by the campaign, the, the Clinton campaign, to go for, um, uh, you know, uh, these suburban Republican voters that I think uh, was misguided and impacted both their rhetoric and their lack of a message that they wanted to give to bring these uh, other people out. I mean, you know, that's the other question is, uh, w was it absolutely necessary? I mean, was it a lack of a message that made it possible for people to knock on that door and find out that they're talking to a Trump voter? Could that person in another universe been a Clinton un uh, a voter? Or were they, was that person always a Trump voter, just a low propensity voter? I mean, just give me your opinion on that, uh, Becky. Well, I think, you know, to the extent to which you have a lot of people that voted for Barack Obama, in 2008 and 2012, and those some of those voters voted for Trump, they were gettable voters, right? And so for, you know, um, there's been lots of speculation about, you know, why those voters went to Trump. And then there's also a lot of people that voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 who did, just didn't turn out, right? And, um, and, and I think we can assume on a certain level that, um, that they didn't, um, they weren't motivated to vote. Right, and it and it and it probably had a, a lot of factors in it, but one of it could be, you know, they um, that they weren't motivated, um, you know, to vote for more of the same. So, um, so you know, I think um, you know what we saw with the Bernie Sanders campaign was that people um, they heard Bernie's message and they were motivated to vote for him and to volunteer for him because they shared his political analysis about um, taking back um, power from um, from the corporations and the one percent. And uh, having government work for the people again, and uh, and that really motivated people. We didn't have that message in the general election, or at least we didn't have it on the. We didn't. The Democrats didn't have it. All right. So uh, you know, well, I reached out to you for this this uh, this interview. You know, uh, maybe over. I don't know. Whatever. It was before the election, and um, I anticipated that we would be talking, uh, uh, obviously, about your book, but um, how the. Um, I don't know. We want to call it the Bernie Sanders wing, the Elizabeth Warren wing, the the more uh, populist, uh, the more grassroots wing of the Democratic Party um, uh, begins to push Hillary Clinton to the left and to, um, you know, focus on uh, a whole uh, policy uh, set of policy uh, issues that uh, we want to change. Obviously, that's uh, we're in a different scenario now. Uh, I want to hear from both of you, uh, and I know we're running out of time here, but uh, Zach, 
from your perspective, uh, what what do we need to do now? Like, how do we take the tools that you're giving us here and just like broad, more broadly speaking, how do we uh, play defense in this situation? And I'm going to add another layer to this. Um, I uh, remember uh, the aughts and uh, and and the idea that um, I was fighting alongside people against the Bush administration who by 2009, I realized, like, we weren't exactly on the same side uh, on these issues, right? Yeah, I mean, there was a right. bit of a popular front. Mm -hmm. How do we maintain the integrity of the more uh, uh, left issue perspective, but at the same time also, you know, um, wh where do we have to, or and do we have to make compromises <clears throat> to fight Donald Trump so that we're not going backwards too far. Well, I mean, there's going to be a lot of playing defense, but we also in in some really important ways, right? Like when he when Trump decides to actually go for, you know, deporting some number of millions of people of our neighbors, right? Uh, but but I think we have to play offense. Um, and what you know, what what just happened, the way Trump got elected was, you know, as we've been saying, that there really wasn't a compelling vision on the other side, right? And 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 the Clinton campaign just, you know, didn't have an answer for how uh, Hillary Clinton was going to, or even just what her vision was to get incomes going back up again, to get job participation going up, uh, you know, to take on mass incarceration, you know, and uh, to deal with police violence and a whole bunch of other stuff. There was no vision there. There was just, you know, kind of empty slogans, right? And, uh, and you know, to the extent that there were policy positions, it was, you know, it was stuff that was clearly, you know, just weak, compromised stuff. Like, instead of free college tuition, it was make college more affordable, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, instead of... You and know, we never okay, heard that in the general. I mean, the fact is, is that it was sitting on the website, but we never heard, it was never, that was right, never right, right. the banner that was yeah. carried. It was just yeah. Donald Trump is a moral monster. And that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. And so I think that's why we, so that's why, that's why the Clinton campaign lost. That's what gave Trump this chance. And also part of what gave Trump his chance was, was, you know, yes, xenophobia, yes, racism. And also because everybody, you know, uh, not you know, I mean, everybody to some extent um, on that Republican GOP stage was talking about. Not, okay, not everybody, but oh, you know, sorry, um, let me start that over. That uh, all, you know, a whole lot of those candidates on the GOP primary stage were talking about talking in really xenophobic terms of you know deporting millions and millions of people. For example, they also were talking about that. Why did Trump win? It was partly because he you know he talked about. Um, these economic issues that uh, in very stark, specific, graphic ways, right? And he really ran far to the left uh, of Hillary Clinton on the economy. And, um, and, you know, while he didn't have a totally coherent economic vision, he painted a very graphic picture of factories being built in, you know, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan communities. He he went all over those states and told that painted this picture over and over and over, and did fill in you know enough details to make it credible. So um, I you know what we need to do is uh, we need to get a, a vision together for the American people of a multiracial, multiethnic, uh, you know, feminist uh, movement that is also talking about income and uh, jobs, right? And, and, and uh, we have to do that. And if we don't do that, um, we're, and, and if, that's not to say this is all about class. Hey, everybody, let's, let's just talk about class. Let's stop talking about all this race and, you know, stuff. That's, that's absolutely wrong because that's also a path to losing and losing and losing. Right. And uh, and it's the immoral path in a society like ours. And so we really have to put a, a, a full fledged vision for for how to actually make everybody's life better. Workers of all uh, races and ethnicities and genders. And if we don't do that, um, we're just going to get nowhere. And if we do it uh, and we organize around that vision, um, we will win. So the question is, though, 
you know, people that have been, you know, there's so many people in the in the Democratic um, establishment now that have kind of been lulled into this, uh, you know, neoliberal, you know, intellectual sleep that uh, it's going to be hard to, to get people, you know, to do what I just said. Yeah, uh, and I think I'll, I'll just add briefly that, like, the, you know, the, the, this election, for the vote in this election, it wasn't so much an endorsement of Donald Trump as much as it was a resounding defeat for Clintonism and neoliberalism. So now we have to we have to resist, we have to rebuild the party, but we absolutely have to offer an alternative because if we don't, we'll we're we're never going to get out of this hole we've dug for ourselves. How, I mean, that was a lot better. Use, use Becky's clip instead of my monologue. Well, <laughs> well, but but Becky, but 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 how do we? I mean, I mean, how do we keep both those tracks going? I mean, how do we uh, avoid the um, the or how do we keep the argument? between those two different visions uh, for America from inhibiting our ability to stop Donald Trump going forward? Look, I think that there's a tremendous capacity in the grassroots to do the work necessary to change this country. And we can see it right now. People are just, they're just bursting out of their workplaces and their schools and into the streets. Um, and they're marching because that's what people are around them are doing and what they're being asked to do. But if we ask them to get to work to you know, overwhelm the 2018 elections and sweep in a new kind of candidate with a uh, with a message that's um, you know that addresses structural racism as well as economic inequality, um, that addresses climate as well as immigration reform, and brings you know working class people um, of color and working class whites together under um, uh, uh, under a vision that's going to actually sort of fix some of these problems that are just so deeply broken in America. I think we can win. It's, it's, it's going to be hard work and we have to start immediately. And there's plenty of energy to do that while we you know, try to oppose the, the worst abuses of the Trump administration. We, we simply have to do it all. But but the good news is, is that if we actually invite the people to be part of these campaigns, we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to have the, um, the capacity to do everything we need to do. Becky Bond, Zach Exley, the book is Rules for Revolutionaries, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate your time today. And um, uh, the book is great, and it's a great resource. And, you know, uh, good for you guys for, uh, for giving it away uh, for far less than uh, consultants uh, tend to charge <laughs> for these things. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. It, 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 it's like we need shows like yours more than ever, and we're just happy to get to contribute to the kind of the work that you do, you know, every day, educating people and starting a conversation. And so, so we're happy to be part of that conversation with you. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tapes, a brand new, amazing podcast for sponsoring today's episode. Secret Crimes and Audio Tape is an audio drama told week after week, features stories about crime love, mystery, or conspiracy with actors you know and love. Some are dramas, some are comedies. Make sure you don't miss a single episode. Subscribe to Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever or however you listen to podcasts. Yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the man